I'm Beth. And I'm Beth. Welcome, welcome to, to Physics, Physics with Beth and Beth. <laughs> Hello and welcome back. We're in AP Physics 1, Unit 3. We're doing Work Energy Power. Today we're going to be talking about the Work Energy Theorem and what it is. We're also going to be adding a couple new terms and another, uh, not new equations, but a different way to use them. All right, so let's just jump right in here. And I'm going to move over here. The Work Energy Theorem states that it's an increase in kinetic energy in a system is equal to the amount of positive work done, by, done on the system. All right, so as always in physics, a lot of words uh, sound confusing, but it's way easier to see it in a demo. So I have just this little eraser here. I'm going to flip it over so I eliminate, uh, not eliminate, but reduce my coefficient of friction, uh, make it a little slicker there. I am going to do work on this. And remember, it says the increase in kinetic energy is equal to the amount of work done on the system. So I'm going to do work on the system. I'm going to give it a horizontal force of a push and it's going to have a displacement. Now remember, it's that parallel force, parallel to displacement, times displacement is equal to work. And I have it over here. It's that what we've been doing in the first of this unit. All right, so as I push on this, it's gonna be at rest, and then it's gonna be moving. It's gonna change in its velocity, which means we're now gonna go from rest to moving, so we have kinetic energy. So that kinetic energy that this thing gets and gains, or the change in that kinetic energy from what um, is equal, I should say, is equal to the work that I do on it. So let me say that again. The work I do on it is gonna be equal to that change in its kinetic energy. And right now it has none, because it's at rest, so no kinetic energy. All right, I'm gonna push with that force and it moves, it starts moving. That work is gonna be equal to the change in kinetic energy. Now you notice that it also slows down very fast as well. That's because friction is taking work out of the system. All right, so that's, uh, that's kind of the gist of the work energy theorem. Now, how we're gonna write that is that work equals that change in kinetic energy. Well, this isn't new for us. These formulas aren't gonna be new. We've been doing energy. We know that kinetic energy is one half, m, uh, one half times mass times velocity squared. And so we're just gonna write this out, but it's a final minus initial because that delta in physics always means final minus initial. So one half mass times final velocity squared minus one half mass times initial velocity squared. It's a lot easier to write it like this where you factor out that one half and mass so that you don't have to keep multiplying that twice. All right, you can just multiply it once. Now, the other way you can write this is remember work equals the change in kinetic energy. So now my work formula, which is that parallel force times parallel to displacement times displacement is equal to again this this side of uh, the change in kinetic energy all right now again we're adding more and more things to our equation tool belt i like to call it and it gets more and more difficult as we go into this class onto which equation to pull out to start the problem with okay and i'm going to say it again you'll hear it a thousand times in these videos probably let the problem guide you all right, so strategy is if you're looking at this problem and you see a change in velocity and they're asking for work, then you're gonna be using this work energy theorem. If you see a problem where they've given you a change in velocity and they're asking for the force that did the work to create that change in velocity, then you're going to be using this little jewel right here. All right, so that's kind of the strategy behind these. Now, I would also like to say that you can apply, work energy theorem was really meant for kinetic energy, but it can be applied to conservative forces. Okay, so let's talk about what conservative and non-conservative forces are. All right, conservative forces I have up here, they are independent of a path. It's a force that moves, can move an object from point A to point B, and it doesn't matter the path it takes. All right, and then non-conservative forces are forces that move an object from point A to point B, but path definitely matters. Okay, so and you're like, yeah, that still didn't, that still didn't help me. Okay, well, let's say I have this vector sign, and if I am, I have it here, so I'm gonna put here as the start. I move it here, I move it here, I move it here, I move it here. All right, my force due to gravity, that's a force, 
It's independent of its path. It doesn't matter that I went over here, over here, over here, over here. My force due to gravity is just going to be straight down. All right, it's going to be mg. It's just straight down. Okay, so that's independent of its path. However, my non-conservative force, let's talk about drag, that, that friction with the air, you know, if for air resistance. If I use this and I move it from here to here to here to here, and I'm talking about trying to figure out how much drag was involved, okay, that was very much dependent on its path that it took versus just straight up. All right, that would not have been equal. So non-conservative forces, path matters. What are our forces that are non-conservative that we deal with in AP Physics 1 is friction and your drag force, okay? Now, conservative forces where path doesn't matter, force due to gravity, and your spring force. It doesn't matter about that spring force, the path either. So on conservative forces, Conservative forces only, don't try this uh, with drag or friction, but conservative forces only, you can apply the work energy theorem. So what that would look like is that work equals the change in your potential energy due to gravity. All right, so like MGH final minus MGH initial. Or work could also equal the change in that spring um, potential energy, and that would be one half k x final squared minus one half k. Uh, ooh, k, not an x. I get ahead of myself. F, uh, k x initial squared. All right, so you could apply these. Just know that that's really not what the work energy theorem was meant for. It was meant for kinetic energy mostly, but it does actually apply for conservative forces. All right, now let's just do an equation. We'll be really quick. Uh, we have a 750 kilogram car. It's speeding up from 15 to 25. How much work did uh, the engine do? All right, we know that work is equal to that change in kinetic energy. All right, and I also know I've got a change in velocity and they won't work. So I'm using this formula right here that that work is gonna be equal to one half mass of that car times the final velocity squared minus that initial velocity squared. All right, if I do this, I'm gonna have one half, the mass is 750, my final velocity was 25 squared, my initial velocity was 15, and that is squared, and I get a number of that work is 150,000 joules. Same unit, because if work equals the change in kinetic energy, that means work's in a joule and kinetic energy's in a joule. Perfect. Now I say, hey, if the car comes to a stop, how much work did the brakes do? Okay, I realize that, that the force involved here is friction, and I just told you that we can't use friction uh, in, in this conservative forces, but we're not, we're not worried about that friction formula. We're worried about this change in kinetic energy, so we can absolutely use kinetic energy always with the work, in, uh, with the work energy theorem. All right, so work equals that change in kinetic energy again, and that's going to be that one half mass times that final velocity squared minus the initial velocity squared. All right, now we're going to just plug and chug. I, that's all there is to this. It's quite easy. We like these problems, especially after we've been doing all those dynamic problems with the tensions and the pulleys and the tables and multiple strings, multiple boxes. You got to love that. So uh, you can take a deep breath and enjoy these now for right now. All right. Mass is 750. Now my final velocity is zero. It goes to zero. All right, because it comes to a stop. My initial velocity, it says the car then comes to a stop, so it's up to 25, and then it comes to a stop, so that's my initial. That's squared, that's squared. And I'm going to get that work is a negative 234,375 joules. Now, why did work come out negative? It's positive here, it's negative here. All right, remember, work is not a vector. This does not have to do with west, east, north, or south, or direction. All right, work is positive if something, if a, if a force added energy to the system, which your engine did. You hit the accelerator, and it added energy into your system. You, you increased in your kinetic energy. 
All right, but in this uh, example, the work done was taking energy out of the system. So it's negative. When work is negative, then it, that force has taken energy out of the system. So that's why we have a positive and then we have a negative. And it certainly took energy out because it comes to a stop and there's no kinetic energy left. Okay, that's it. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please like it. Please subscribe uh, so that you can see our videos that are coming out next on power. And thank you for watching and happy physicsing.